Good morning. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started with our worship service. We're going to start with our announcements. The first thing we're going to ask for is birthdays. Anyone celebrating a birthday? Got some movement back there. Kendra's having a birthday. Anybody else? Okay, let's sing happy birthday. Are there any anniversaries this week? Thirty-five years for Ghana and Dean Scoggins. Okay, then we're going to move on to the announcements. This is the Young at Heart um, Christmas event. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Friday, December 16th at 2 p.m. Lunch beforehand at the Houston Tavern. Tickets, <laughs> tickets are $36 per person. Full balance is due on November 6th. Tickets are non-refundable. There's a sign-up sheet out there in the foyer. Um, does anybody have anything to say about this? This is Sally's, isn't it? Yeah, she mentioned before something about trying to maybe take the bus. Okay, she, so anyway, talk to Sally about that if you're interested in that on November 4th. Children's Christmas program is December 18th, and that's going to be a youth-directed Sunday um, uh, with special guest musicians and a special guest speaker. Um, then there'll be lunch to follow that day, so keep that in mind for December 18th at 9 a.m. Family Night Supper is tonight at 5 p.m. The music night will follow. It's a carry-in dinner, so you'll have to, there's no meat provided, so think accordingly when you bring your food. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have special music and uh, here in the sanctuary, I assume, that's where that will be. But tonight at 5 p.m. Tech volunteers, if you're interested in working with our overhead and our sound and um, talk to Eric or Buddy. They're up there in the bird's nest. Uh, they could use some help with that. If you're, they'll help you figure out how to, to do it. If you're interested in it, they'll talk with you about that. Welcome to fall, y'all. Um, I think that's an event, but I really don't. Okay. We'll wait for Sally to be here to tell you all about that, but she better not wait too later. We'll be into winter. <clears throat> okay, um, there was a couple announcements I had. Um, the food pantry is over in the fellowship hall. If anybody is interested in that, know anybody that needs any um, supplies or if you need supplies, the pantry is over there in the fellowship hall. Um, if you want to donate, it's um, monetary donations to help keep the food pantry stocked. If you want to know more about that, you'll have to talk to Gay Castello. She's not here today, but you can talk to her and she'll let you know exactly. But it is in the fellowship hall. Anyone is welcome to go over there and get what they need or get what they need for someone else. And Tammy wanted me to announce that this week at Bible Club... Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this week at Bible Club, there were 44 kids. That's up from 27 the week before. <laughs> And there are still um, forms out in the foyer if you want to pick one up and want your child to come to Bible Club, pick that form up and, and uh, get it turned into the school and to Tammy. Now, buddy, you can hit it.
Okay, so shoe boxes. They have to be picked up here but at the church November 14th. There's boxes out there. If you don't want to use those boxes, you can buy the, the plastic shoe boxes. Dollar Tree has them, Walmart has them. And pack your box. Um, there are the little things that go on top of the box for what age child you're buying for. Just mark that. There's a $10, um, they ask for $10 for shipping for each box. Um, so if you want to stick that inside the box, that's, or the, inside the envelope is good too. Um, so if you need any more information about that, um, Patty and Laura's not here today, but <clears throat> they usually pick up those boxes, but it's November 14th is when we have to have them in. So let's get thinking about it. And I wanted to let the congregation know that from our fundraiser, <clears throat> from our three organizations that receive the, the funds from the um, fundraiser, is Global Compassion Ministries from St. Charles, which a lot of the people in this congregation have gone on mission trips with them, and uh, Global Outreach International, which are the RUNCs that have been here and spoke a couple times, um, and the other one is Sustainable Food Production, which Jamie's a part of, and uh, Joe Perkins, and they've both been here, and Cheryl Russell have been here many times also. We sent that money out this week, um, there was $21,500 in that, so each one of them got $7,167. So um, I want to thank everybody for helping with that so that we could send those funds uh, to them. And in case you didn't see the email, the RUNCs are now in the States. They did get out of Haiti, so they're in the States and don't know when they'll get to go back. But the well drilling, I had a, a text from Nikki yesterday. The well drilling is still trying to go on in Haiti uh, with his equipment and with the Haitians. So. Um, our money is sent there for, to drill wells for clean water, so hopefully they can continue to do that and keep them in their prayers too. And Eli has something he needs to speak about. Morning, everybody. Uh, as you know, Pastor Cody's uh, moving on. Uh, we formed a pulpit search committee. Uh, there's nine people on that committee, made up of myself, Eric Paul, Kathy Smith, John Smart, John Castello, John Farley, Brenda Horseman, Faith Woodson, and Buddy Maddox. Uh, we had our first big meeting this past Monday night. Um, we have a congregational survey. They're out here on the table. If you guys want to pick those up, fill them out. They're also on our website. If you want to get on the website, fill it out there. If you don't want to mess with the paper copy, there's a, a second wooden box out there on the table. Um, not the one with, for the offering, but there's another one there. If you want to fill them out and put them in there. And uh, anybody that wants to fill these out, you don't have to be a member or anything like that. We just kind of want to get a pulse of what the congregation feels we need um, as qualities in a pastor. So if you guys would fill that out and be in prayer for the committee, greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right, let's move into our prayer time. Anybody have any praises they'd like to share? Yes. Praise God. Yeah, well, fantastic. That's amazing. Good. Other praises. Yes. Okay, what did you say the name of the town was? Wow. Yeah, so we need to keep the people of that town in prayer and then also be, you know, just be mindful of maybe ways that we can help out too as a congregation. So, all right. Um,
<laughs> yeah, so in case anybody couldn't hear that on the stream online there, uh, just keep Cameron in your prayers. He's about to go in for five, uh, five weeks straight uh, treatment in St. Louis where he has to stay there and has to have somebody with him 24-7. Uh, also mentioned there's a benefit coming up for him November 19th at the VFW in Fulton and uh, just requesting desserts for that. Um, other praises, prayer requests. Delilah. Uh, praise Yeah. <laughs> the Blankenship family? Okay, say Cliff Blankenship, Loftus' wife? Yeah. Okay, all right, so we'll keep the Blankenship family in our prayers there. Nathan, I think I saw your hand as well. go yeah all right well there you go so the silent auction as well so if you want to uh, donate items for that feel free and then also uh, praise that Lisa made it through her surgery and that Delilah made it through Lisa's surgery too and uh, yeah they're both recovering from that <laughs> all right any others yes So we'll keep them in our prayers there as yeah, that's a that's a tragic event to go through there. All right. Any others? Yes. Sure, sure, that it will be a peaceable event, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because that's a wonderful opportunity, too, but yeah, that's, that's stressful to try to organize and, yeah, allocate space for, so we'll, we'll keep that event in our prayers as well. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, we'll keep her in our prayers as well there. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, kids are traveling, the FFA students are traveling to Indianapolis, so keep them in prayers for safe travels as well. Um, any others? I'll just mention uh, Kelsey and Hezekiah are at home. Uh, Kelsey, so we've, we've just had some sort of bug of some sort going through our family, um, and it hit me early in the week, but Yesterday, Kelsey's throat just started getting sore towards the end of the day, and then her ears started hurting, and then she woke up feeling pretty miserable this morning. So just keep her in your prayers as well. Hezekiah's been sort of grumpy too, but his is more teething related, I think, and toddler related. But yeah, uh, Tammy. Okay, so keep Sharon, uh, keep Sharon and Bill in your prayers. Eric Sharon's mother passed away. I know Bill's mom passed away. Goodness, just earlier this year as well. So just keep them in your prayers too. Any others? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Joseph De Brody passed away. Obviously, a big tragic event there. So you know, keep the family in your prayers on that. All right. Let's bow our heads together. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, 
We come to you first with thanksgiving, with praise, because, dear God, in spite of all the, the tough things we see, uh, we know that you are good, dear God, and we know that you have a good plan, a plan for prosperity. And that's not earthly prosperity, but you have a plan that ends with your son on the throne with your people living in a land where righteousness dwells, where holiness dwells, where there is no more sickness and no more pain. But dear God, we also come to you in thanksgiving, not in spite of, of these needs, but because of these needs, because we know that we can present our requests to you and we know that you hear them and that you will act on our behalf, dear God. So, dear God, there are too many, uh, too many needs to even mention again, but dear God, you heard all of those needs and you know even the needs that weren't brought up. Dear God, I ask that you meet these needs in a mighty way, dear God, for those who are sick and afflicted, for those who are mourning, for those who are traveling, for those who are organizing events, dear God, for all of the just different chaos going on in our lives and in our community and in the world. Dear God, these seem to be dark times in our land. And so dear God, I ask that you shine forth your light and that you Use us as you've intended us to be, for Jesus said that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, but we know we are only effective in being that when we are reflecting your light. So, dear God, we ask this morning that you would shine your light through us, that we might be a blessing, that we might be the signs of hope, the signs of encouragement in an in increasingly discouraged world. Dear God, use this service to that end. Pour, pour your love into us, dear God. Challenge us and change us. Uh, encourage us, transform us, equip us, oh God, that we might be ready to be a blessing to all those who we come into contact with. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Well, if you listen to Caleb, about a week ago, Sid let me know, I don't really listen to Caleb a lot, but about a week ago, they had, uh, how many years was it for their celebration? 40, 40 years? A 40 year celebration where they were playing some of the top songs from, you know, the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, and the 20 teens. <laughs> Apparently, they were thinking alike with me when I was playing them some of these songs. So this is a, a classic you might know from the early 90s called Shout to the Lord. I'd love for you to stand with us as we begin in worship. <clears throat> Lord, there 
hasn't been a, a great few years as far as world events go. But how long do you think it'll take us in heaven before we forget about all of that? How long for all the pain that you're going through, whatever it might be, the second we see our Lord Jesus Christ face to face and all of that vanishes away, how long before we simply forget? Better is one day because of just how good our God is. I invite you to remain standing, but if you need to, as always, feel free to take a seat. story of Saul and David and their interactions. I'm sure you can guess what's going to happen in chapter 31 based on what we talked about in chapter 28, that Saul was just told that he is about to die, and then the story is firmly going to fix in on David. And so what we're going to see today in 1 Samuel 30, the story focuses on David, but really we will see in many ways, the climax of the contrast between the two characters, which is going to be incredibly important for us because we need to understand clearly and without a shadow of a doubt what made Saul a bad king and what's going to make David a good king. Because there were lots of differences between the two of them. And it's not that every quality about Saul was bad and every quality about David was good. We know David makes his mistakes too. But we know that the kingship of David is looked back upon fondly by God. He, he was looked at as the example. He's looked at as the, basically the paragon of virtue among Israel's kings. That he was considered a great guy, whereas Saul's kingdom mostly forgotten about or, or looked at as a negative example. And there's one very specific difference between the two of them that we're going to see illustrated in our story today. So if I can remind you, since we sort of bounced around as far as chapters go over the past couple weeks, where, where David's story left off at the end of chapter 29, the Philistines are gathering their armies to go and fight against the Israelites, and David and his men are preparing to go and fight with the Philistines against the Israelites. Except the lords of Philistines say, wait a minute, yeah, he's been an enemy to Israel, but wouldn't this be a really good opportunity for him to get back in their good graces? We can't let him go to fight against us. He'll turn against us. And so they say, David, rather than that, you need to go home. You go home and you just sit this one out. And that's where chapter 30 picks up. Now, when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, which is where they were living at the time, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negeb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. So when David and his troops made it home, they found that their home had been raided and all of their houses had been burned down. And taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went on their way. So not only was their town destroyed, but all of their loved ones had been taken away, kidnapped. How do we know that they weren't killed? Well, the text tells us, but thankfully there's good news towards the, the end of the story that confirms that for us. And when David and his men come to, came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. There's one thing that I want you to remember as we go through this story, because there's a lot of tragedy in this story, but there's also a lot of timing in this story. What I want you to remember is that God is completely in control of the events of this story. Even though it involved their entire town being burned down and all their wives and children being kidnapped. Think about this with me for just a second here. The Amalekites likely knew something. 
They likely knew that the Philistines were about to go to war with Israel, and they likely planned this raid around that war. Said, you know what? These guys are going to be away from their homes. They're going to be defenseless. And David and his men had been making raids against the Amalekites. This will be the perfect opportunity for us to go in and get revenge. Because David and his men are going to be gone. They're going to be fighting. But then lo and behold, David and his men were sent home before the fighting even started. So David and his men weren't in time to fight off the Amalekites, but they were there early enough to be able to assess and to act before things got too out of hand. So just keep in mind the timing of the Lord, and that's going to come up more throughout the chapter. Verse 4, Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. We're often told in culture today for men that it's not okay for men to cry. Because that means that men aren't very tough if they're crying. Anyone think that they are tougher than David or the men who lived with him? And it says they wept until they had no more strength to weep. They cried their eyes out, so to speak, out of sorrow. Because they, they had been through a lot. This isn't the first time that they've lost everything that they loved. They had been chased out of their homeland. They had lost all of their friends, all of their possessions. And now this happens again in this foreign land. And not only that, but all of their wives and children were taken away from them too. They literally lost everything. David's two wives had also been taken captive. Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. So, you know, this, this just to help... This verse just helps us see the full picture, saying, hey, they took everybody. They took David's wives, too. And David was greatly distressed. This is, the, this is a key verse here in this chapter. David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So let's consider both portions of this verse here. First of all, the people considered stoning David. Why is that? Well, because to this point, they went to David thinking David was going to be their savior. And rather than saving them and putting them in positions of power, they've had to flee to the land of the Philistines, and now all their stuff's been taken away in the land of Philistines. They've followed this guy with their whole heart, and it has amounted to nothing. It's what they're saying in the immediate moment. Does that sound familiar at all? Think about Jesus and the apostles. When Jesus came the first time, say, oh, this guy's the Messiah. Things are going to be great for us, and we're getting in on the ground floor. The apostles thought that. Hey, uh, they're even having arguments. Who's going to sit at your right hand when you're ruling? Oh, I want it to be me. Oh, no, I want it to be, to be me. And they all got mad and argued with each other. But then for a time, it looked like, oh, wait. What happened? Jesus, this man who, who's supposed to be our Savior, he, he went and died on a cross? What do we do? We had put all of our hope in this guy. And now he's dead. Obviously, it's not the same situation, but it's a similar situation. You can see a pattern there. They lost everything but David. I love the, uh, the word but in the Bible. That was not meant to be a joke, for the, especially for the kids there. I love that transition. Anytime you see but God or, or, or some sort of, you know, yeah, things are bad, but... But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Why was David able to do that? You know, we said these people have went through a lot. They've went through perilous situations multiple times. And as sorry as we can feel for them, when you go through perilous situations, you learn from those perilous situations. And what had David learned every step of the way? Even though things are terrible, even though things are difficult, I bet God has a plan and he's going to work this out for us. Even though things look incredibly bleak, I'm sure God has a plan. Because every step of the way before when things looked bleak, God delivered. 
every time we were hiding in a cave or, or we were fleeing from one place to the next and, and we thought we had lost all hope, God stepped in. So David was able to strengthen himself in the Lord. And he knew that his God was a mighty deliverer. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. The ephod, let me remind you, is the way in which uh, God would answer the people through the priest that they could know the will of the Lord. They have already taken their time to mourn because perhaps they didn't realize that all of them had been kidnapped. Perhaps they thought they had been killed, though they hadn't found their graves. But they went from having no hope and thinking, hey, let's kill David, to David saying, wait a minute. Come on now, what are we thinking? Bring me the ephod. Let's talk to God about this. How long does it take you to make that transition in your life when you're in a perilous time? How long do you wallow in your suffering before you say, you know what? I need to go to God with this. I, I would advise you, the less time it gets you, it takes you to get from point A to point B on that, the more peace you'll have in your soul. Your situation won't get better right away every time. In fact, it probably won't get better right away any time. But simply renewing your strength in the Lord, renewing your mind in the Lord, reminding yourself that God is good and talking to him and taking it to him can change your entire outlook on the situation. Because look at this. David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after them? Shall I overtake him? He answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. Keep in mind, last week we looked at the story of Saul, and Saul was trying to inquire of the Lord, and what did the Lord say to Saul? Nothing at all. And because God went and talked to Saul, Saul went and found a medium, a necromancer, to talk to the spirits of the dead for him. But how many times did David have to ask? How long did he have to wait for an answer from God here? Apparently not very long at all. And he said, hey, shall I pursue? He said, pursue, but he doesn't just say pursue. He says, you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. Pursue because you're going to win and you're going to save those people who, who have been taken away, who've been taken captive. So David set out and the 600 men who were with him and they came to the brook Bezor who, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men. 200 stayed behind who were too exhausted to cross the brook Bezor. Keep in mind, these men had just cried their eyes out. They had just poured out the agony of their souls. And so even though these guys are soldiers, when they get to this brook, 200 of them say, we just can't keep going. We're going to slow you guys down. We're exhausted. We need to stay behind. And so David says, okay, hey, 200 of you, you guys go ahead and stay here. The rest of us, let's keep going. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate. They gave him water to drink. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived. For he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. So they stumble across this Egyptian who is starving, who's dehydrated, who's dying out there basically in the desert. And they give this guy food and water to revive him here. And David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. Here's what I want you to understand. God is completely in control of these circumstances. Because... David and his men, they knew the general direction in which the Amalekites might have went. But I mean, that'd be like saying, hey, some, some people were here a few days ago and they went that away. Good luck finding them. I mean, you might be able to if you get really lucky. But basically, they're just heading in a general direction until they come across this Egyptian. This Egyptian that just so happened to get sick and become a nuisance to his master... So that the master just so happened to say, hey, we're not bringing you along with us anymore. We're going to leave you behind and leave you for dead. That then the Israelites heading in their general direction just so happened. I'm saying that 
facetiously each time, just so happened, because it's not a mistake, it's not an accident, it's the providence of God. They just so happened to come across him, and rather than killing him, because that wouldn't have been smart of them to do in the first place, they, they invest in this guy, who now reveals, hey, I'm a servant of an Amalekite. My master left me behind three days ago because I fell sick. We had made a raid against the Negev of the Cherethites and against that which belongs to Judah and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, will you take me down to this band? Now, this is interesting. This guy is originally, he's ethnically an Egyptian who had been taken as a servant to an, by an Amalekite. So the Amalekite was his owner, so to speak. Do you think he would have been very motivated to take the Israelites to go and find the Amalekites? Depends how well his owner had treated him, right? If he had been a good master to him, oh no, I've got to respect my master. But he just left him for dead three days ago. There's probably no one who wants to see this master dead more than this servant who was left in the desert to basically starve to death and dehydrate while he was sick than this servant. But he answers, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. So now all of a sudden, because of, okay, so once again, this is the sovereignty of God. Trace the events. God, in this case, caused the servant to get sick, caused the master to get frustrated, to leave the servant behind, so that the servant would be right where David and the Israelites needed him to be, so that they could be merciful to him, so that he would be angry enough at his master, he would say, yeah, I'll take you right to him. God caused all of those events to happen in sequential order there. And he says, so I'll take you down there. It's amazing that, you know, you think God needs us for his purposes? No. Do you ever feel like you're under pressure that, hey, if I don't do things exactly correctly, if I do not make the exact right next move, I've just messed up God's plan for my life. You ever feel like that? I feel like that all the time. I get stressed out about it and you realize like, God's plan for your life just isn't that fragile. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to make wrong decisions. God did not intend for David to sin with Bathsheba down the line. He did not intend for David to make any sinful decisions. Yet God's plan could accommodate for all of the mistakes that David makes. Okay? God does not intend for you to do anything evil or disobedient against him. But God knows that you are going to fall short at times. But his plan for your life just isn't that fragile. He knows how to take the wrong that you've done and still somehow turn it around so it ends up blessing you. As I said, Bathsheba was the mother of Solomon, who ended up being David's heir to the throne. So anyway, so God's sovereignty is showing up here. In verse 16, And when he had taken them, him down, behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. The Amalekites here think, hey, we don't have to be in a hurry to get back to the strongholds because the Philistines are so distracted because they're off fighting the Israelites. So we've made it away scot-free. Let's have a party. And they're eating and drinking and getting drunk, as, as you know, they do. And so they are not at all ready for the Israelites to attack. And David struck them down from twilight until evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. Think about this. How many men were with David at this point? 400 men. 400 Amalekites escaped on camels, which means their overall military force had to be much greater in number than David and his 400 men. And yet David and his 400 men had just an absolute slaughter of a victory. In part because the Amalekites were drunk, but also in part because, once again, God even sovereignly planned that. So that, hey, you know what? By the time you get to them, they're not going to be ready to fight you. They're going to be disorganized, scattered, and having a party, and you're going to go and you're going to have a great victory immediately over them. So God provides a victory there. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back 
all. Keep in mind, the day before, perhaps, his men wanted to stone him because they had lost everything. But now they had everything back. Not only that, David also captured all the flocks and herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. So they not only got back everything that they lost, it seems that they profited from this venture. Now, I told you there, there's some similarities to this story in the story of Jesus, and, and this is another similarity. What did Jesus say on the subject? He said, hey, any one of you who loses father or mother or brother or sister or friends or homes or whatever it might be will not only have that back, but will have so much more than that in the age that is to come. When the, the disciples, when they thought that things were at their absolute worst, when Jesus was in the grave, when he was in the tomb, Jesus rose from the dead. And their lives after the resurrection from, of, by Jesus were so much better than before because God ended up sending them the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that completely changed their understanding and their way of living. But at the time that things were hopeless and they were about ready to give up, they stayed just a little bit further. And Jesus came back and he blessed them, just as it happened basically in this story. And look, look at how much of the credit is given to David here at the beginning. This is David's spoil. Not this is our spoil, this is David's spoil. Then David came to the 200 men, and here's why that's important, who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Bezor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. So we get many happy returns. They come back to the men and these 200 men who were exhausted, who were probably feeling pretty worthless because, hey, we can't even go rescue our own wives and children. Now all of a sudden get to see their wives, children, all their loved ones coming back to meet them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. They say, you know what? Since you guys didn't fight with us, you don't get any of the stuff we just got, except we will let you have your wives and children back. You get those, but you don't get any of the possessions. But David said, you shall not do so, my brothers with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Okay, consider the contrast here because this is going to be the most important thing you take home today, in my opinion. The men, first of all, wanted to give credit to David. This is David's spoil. Then, when they met the 200 who stayed behind, the men wanted to give credit to themselves. Hey, we worked really hard for this, so we deserve this spoil, but you guys sat around here at the brook, so you don't get any of it. And we could see sort of the justification for that on our own, own end, right? Like, I don't like a lot of government policies that say, hey, you have to work really hard to pay taxes so that we can pay for people who don't work at all. I don't like those policies, do you? Okay, and that's, that's as far into politics as I'll get today, but, but I get it. So I get what the men are saying. We fought really hard for this. You guys sat by the water... But David says, no, 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 they're still going to get a share because the credit doesn't go to me and the credit doesn't go to you guys. Who does the credit go to? God. You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. And because the Lord is the one who is giving the victory, only the Lord gets to decide, basically, who gets the spoils. Does that remind you of any parables in the New Testament? How about there's a man who went out to hire people to work in his vineyard. And he said, look, I will give you, what is it, a denarius for working for me for the day. And they say, okay, that's good. That's fair wage. Let's do that. And then later on in the day, he goes and hires some more. And then he gets even to the very end of the day, and he goes and hires even more people. And so he lines them all up to pay him. And he goes to the ones who had just worked a couple of hours, and he pays them a denarius. So the people who have been working all day said, oh boy, we had agreed for a denarius, but if he's given them that, he's going to give us a lot more. And when Jesus, or sorry, in the parable, when the, when the master gets to the last one, he still only gives them a denarius. And they say, wait a minute, that's not fair. They only worked for a couple hours and they got paid the same amount we did. 
And he said, am I not free to do with my money what I want? Now, here's an application, because this is, this is important for you and for me. Christians for centuries met in homes. Christians for centuries operated underground. Christians for centuries were martyred for their faith, died, sometimes for the simplest of doctrines. We baptize people who come to faith in Jesus Christ. There was a time that that was considered heresy because, no, you only baptize people when they're babies. And so the Anabaptists were slaughtered simply for believing that you baptize people after they come to faith in Jesus Christ. That was considered a false doctrine worthy of death. There were people who died so that you could be sitting here comfortably today reading your Bibles, you know, drinking your coffee, being able to watch this in a nice building where I know it gets hot or cold at times. What I'm getting at is, in many ways, even though we could go through very difficult situations, our salvation is not lesser than those who went through excruciating details. They might have a greater reward than us for some things, and rightfully so, right? But we get the same salvation as those who crawled and bled and died so that we could walk. God is amazing in that way. But let's, let's keep going in the story just a little bit here. Who would listen to you in this matter? This is David talking. For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the luggage. They shall share alike. Because the Lord was the one who gave the victory, the spoils would go to all the people. Okay. That's an important concept that we're going to come back to in just a minute. Verse 25, and he made it a statute, a law basically, and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. So whenever this was compiled, this became the practice that all of the military and all the people basically shared in the victory, even if they didn't fight in each and every battle. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. So not only, not only does he give it to his people who were with him there, the ones who fought and the ones who didn't, but he even sends it to his people back in Judah as a gift. Even though, remember, some of the people in Judah had actively betrayed him and tried to hand him over to Saul. Very interesting. It was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth of the Negev, in Jatir, in Aroer, in Sifmoth, in Estemoa. If you don't know Hebrew, by the way, you probably know I'm mispronouncing these. Um, just roll with it. In Rakal, in the cities of the Jeramulites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Hormah, in Borashan, in Athach, Athach, in Hebron, for all the places where David and his men had roamed. Man, how much do you think David even kept for himself at that point if he's sending gifts to all those towns and giving gifts to all of his men? David probably just kept a humble share for himself. What are you thinking here, David? Your men have basically betrayed you at this point. You know, it doesn't make a lot of logical sense the way that David is giving out these gifts is what I'm getting at. He would have every earthly reason to say, no, 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 if you guys weren't helping, you don't get any of it. Especially not the people over there in the promised land who turned their backs on us and made us leave and go flee to the Philistines. And yet David operated differently than a normal human being would have in those circumstances. And that is the biggest contrast between Saul and David. David was not perfect, we know this well, but he succeeded greatly in one specific area where Saul failed. And ultimately, the New Testament is going to help us get a full understanding of what this contrast is. So there are a number of passages here. You're welcome to turn along with me, or you can just follow along on the screen. The first one is in Matthew chapter 6. These are the words of Jesus, and he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let me tell you a quick story about my wife. As many of you guys know, uh, when my wife was a teenager, their, their house that they lived in exploded. They lost a lot of their uh, memories, a lot of their keepsakes. 
as a result of that, my wife isn't a super sentimental person. She keeps some things, you know, I, I okay, let's, let's get an aside here. When you get cards, how long do you keep cards for? I never know how long to keep them. You know, I read the card, but if you put it away in storage, are you actually going to get it back out and look at it? Typically, no. So, so sometimes I'm the type of person that I read it, I appreciate the card, but then it ends up in the trash. My wife likes to keep cards for, for quite a long time. But that's about the limit of how much, you know, sentimentality she has on keeping stuff. Because she had already seen, hey, we lost all that stuff, and it didn't take away the memories of loved ones. It didn't take away memories of all that. Think about David's circumstances. David had lost everything on multiple occasions and had lived on the run for a long time. Do you think David cared all that much about earthly possessions? No, because they would come and they would go every step of the way. I think David cared about heavenly possessions. David was not greedy for earthly gain. He was focused on the bigger picture, which was the glory of God of God, whereas Saul, on the other hand, was willing to compromise any of his normal values in order to preserve his position and his possessions. Saul had built a statue to himself. You know, Saul really cared about all that stuff, and Saul normally would not have went to see a medium or a necromancer. But hey, he just had to have that answer. He just had to know, so even though normally that would be a value he'd hold on to, if it meant preserving himself, he'd do all sorts of despicable things. Because Saul really only cared about Saul. Saul's kingdom, Saul's power, Saul's position. David was less worried about personal possessions. Luke 17, 7. Will any of you, also the words of Jesus, who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in the, from the field, come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Basically, Jesus is saying, hey, if you have a servant, when he comes in, you don't say, oh, you kick back and relax. No, you would say to your servant, hey, serve me food, and then afterwards you can eat. Does he thank his servant because he did what was commanded? Keep in mind, it's a different society than we live in today. Okay. These people who were in servanthood, they, were, they sold themselves into servanthood typically to pay for a debt that they couldn't otherwise pay. But he says, so you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Basically what Jesus is saying, hey, when you think you're doing something great for God, do you think that God somehow owes you something? No, rather, when you do work for God, all you need to come in and say is, hey, I'm an unworthy servant. All I've done is, is what God gave me to do. All I've done was my duty, what I, what I was supposed to do. Keep in mind, Saul's jealousy was rooted around the recognition that David was getting. What initially made Saul jealous was when they sang the song that Saul had slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. When Saul heard that, that's when the root of jealousy built up in him. Did David write songs about how great David was? Oh, look at all the people I've slain and all the things I've done. No. What, what was the topic of most of David's songs? mostly praising God. He would talk about, oh, my, my situation is terrible, but I praise you, God, because you're great and your throne is high and lifted up. You are, you, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You lead me basically wherever I go. Saul was focused on Saul and Saul's recognition, but David was less worried about recognition and more focused on the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Words of Paul here, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. David understood this principle very well that, that Paul is illustrating here. Clay at the time was a very cheap material. It was easily accessible and it was not overly decorated, not overly expensive. It was, it was breakable, but it was easy to get and use, uh, similar to something like Tupperware is for us today, to be honest, where, you know, it's, it's there. You, you don't show off your fancy Tupperware unless you're trying to sell it. 
Um, it's, it's just not that big of a deal. Clay wasn't that big of a deal back then. It wasn't like the fancy china that, you know, you have that no one's allowed to use. This was just something you could use for any number of things. But clay was sometimes used to store the most basic of things, but sometimes used to store very, very valuable possessions. Think about that, you know, uh, how much did your wallet cost? Or your purse cost? Sometimes I know purses cost a lot. But oftentimes the possessions inside of your wallet or, or inside of your purse are much more valuable from a monetary standpoint than the thing that's holding them, right? That's sort of the idea that's being presented by Paul, that, hey, we're just jars of clay. There's not a ton of value in us, but what's valuable is what God has placed inside of us. David was a special guy, but what made David so special was not actually any of his amazing talents or gifts. David eventually was a mighty warrior, but when David fought Goliath, was he a mighty warrior? No, he was a kid. He didn't know what he was doing on the battlefield necessarily. He had only fought animals. Very different to fight an animal than to just fight a human. Okay? Was David an amazing king? No, I mean, he becomes an amazing king. But what made David special was not any of his talents or gifts in and of itself. What made David special was the fact that he realized that it wasn't about him. It wasn't about David. It was about God. Last passage for this morning, Philippians 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. By the way, I should mention, Paul also knew that very well, because Paul thought he had a lot of value in himself until he met Jesus on, on the road to Damascus, and J Jesus struck him with blindness. Hey, how well can you study? How smart can you be if you can't even see the words anymore, Paul? Okay? Paul realized pretty quickly, okay, it's not about me, is it? It's about God. All right. Also the words of Paul here, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The way that David became great is the same way that Jesus became great. I say became with quotes there because Jesus has been great before the foundations of the world. David became great not by telling everyone how great he was, but by surrendering himself to God, by humbling himself. Jesus humbled himself, was born in a feeding trough, in a stable, lived a humble life, and then died a humble death. And because of that, because of who he was and what he was willing to do, God bestowed on him the name above all names so that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he would have authority over all of creation. 12 and 13 gives us an application to that. Therefore, you know, consider yourselves to have the same mind that Christ Jesus had. My beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Do we work for our salvation? No. So then why does he say work out your own salvation? Well, he's going to answer that in the final verse we'll cover today. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He says work out your own salvation. God's going to put all this into you. He's going to give it to you. You just take it and basically chew on it and process it, so to speak. But God is the one who gets all of the glory. God is the one who gets all of the credit. Okay, it's no secret at this point. We're, we're, Kelsey and I are moving on from the church, and that hasn't been an easy thing. But one thing that has made it 
easier for us to let go because even though we know that, that it is time, that God has made it very clear that it's time for us to move on, it still doesn't make it any easier to let go because we love you guys, okay? We, we love you and we, in some ways, we want to continue on here, but that's only when I make it about myself. I want, I want, I want to try to do this. When I surrender to God and say, God, what, what would you have me do? It's okay. Move on. Because this church is not about me. This church is not about you. If we make it about me or we make it about you, if it becomes a church of, well, I want it this way or I want it this way or I think we should do this or... You see what kind of problems that presents? It has to be God, what do you want? It has to be all about God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. What differentiated Saul and David is that Saul wanted all the work to be done in his name for his credit, and David wanted all, everything to be done in the Lord's name for the Lord's credit. We have to apply that to our lives. You can be incredibly effective in ministry. And when I say ministry, I don't mean being a pastor. I don't mean being a Sunday school teacher. Those are ministries, but you need to, to we have to break the mold of what we consider ministry to be. Wherever you are, whatever God gives you to do is a ministry or can be a ministry. There is no separation between your sacred life, your spiritual life, and your earthly life. If there is, that's actually sin, just so you know. If you are not who you are in the sight of God, everywhere you are, then, then Jesus would call you a hypocrite, because a hypocrite is an actor, someone who puts on a performance for people. Wherever God has placed you is your ministry. And if you want to be successful, if you want to be great, if you want to be great in the sight of God, you have to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, who was the greatest being, who was God himself, and said, you know what? Yes, I am, but I'm going to come down and be the lowest servant. On the night that I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to wash the stinky feet of all of my disciples, including the one who's going to betray me. I'm going to wash his feet. That's what I'm going to do, because that's what it takes in order to be great. Whoever wants to be greatest among you must become least and the servant of all. That's what made David great. That's what can make each and every one of you great. It's not bad to desire greatness, so long as you know that the way to be great is through humility. The way to go up is down. The way to get stronger is to spend time on your knees in prayer, going before the Lord and saying, God, it's all about you. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work. Not for your goals, not for your good pleasure, not so you can have an easy life, but for his good pleasure. In the end, it's all about God. Let's pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, when we make things all about you, when we remove ourselves from the situation, when we remove our selfish desires, our wants, our cares, our worries, and we simply say, God, what's going to bring you glory? What do you desire? What do you want, O oh Lord? What a blessing takes place. What a peace that passes all understanding can enter in. What holiness, what healthiness, what righteousness comes in. Dear God, this church does some amazing things. Dear God, help, help us as a church to be fully surrendered to your will. That it won't matter who gets the credit. It won't matter even who does the work. But that we might all share in the blessing because we all give the credit to where credit is truly due to you. Dear God, let us still honor those who labor among us because the, the worker deserves their wages. But dear God, help us to be wholly surrendered to your kingdom, your glory, and your will. I ask this in the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. As we prepare for
Father, in that song, it says, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. But we are blessed. His salvation is all we need. And as we humble ourselves and we take this bread that represents his body, and we look upon the cross and we we see what a sacrifice he made for our sins, not that anybody took his life, but that he gave it freely and laid it down himself. Jesus said, That many will say, Lord, Lord, and many will prophesy, and many will drive out demons, and many will perform miracles. And Jesus will say, go away from me, evildoers, I never knew you. But not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Father, I was reading in my notes a while back that about 70% of Americans identify with Christianity. But only about 15% believe that Jesus is the only way. And when you look upon the cross and his body hanging there, and we see the truth of the gospel, the truth of the Bible in its entirety, we know that that is true. Jesus is the only way. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no one comes to the Father but by me. So, Father, we humble ourselves as we take this bread, knowing that Jesus' sacrifice is the only way to you. And, Father God, once again, as we continue to just thank you for the wonderful things in this life that we have, Heavenly Father. It is because of you. And Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this time of the week, Heavenly Father, the first day that we gather as your children to partake, Heavenly Father. Just continue to bless each of us, Heavenly Father, as we walk through this life. And when it comes the time for us to walk to the other side, Heavenly Father, continue to bless us. Father, we just love you, and we love your son, Jesus, because it is through his name we pray. Amen.
clear theme here that we also get ready to head into this last song. This is a song that I think you all know very, very well. And it's the theme of surrender. It's the theme of giving things over to God. We carry too much a lot of times. We, we try to control things. We, what a privilege it is to carry things to God. You know what needless pain we bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Are you ready to let go? Are you ready to give it over and say, God, I surrender. Stand with us and sing this song with us, if you will. I surrender all. Don't forget about Family Night Supper tonight at 5 with music at 6.